This is a crystal called Beta Barium Borate, and it has the interesting property that when you shine an ultraviolet laser through it, like the 405 nanometer laser inside of a Blu-ray player, there's a chance that one particle of light, a photon, will come out of the crystal as two photons. In order for energy to be conserved, each photon has half the energy of the original, therefore double the wavelength. So photons that get split come out as infrared light. The really interesting thing about these two photons, though, is that one will be horizontally polarized and the other will be vertically polarized, but we don't know which one is which. Once we look at one of the photons, the other photon will be forced to become the opposite polarization than the one that we saw, no matter how far away it is. Of course, we don't control the polarization, but up until we looked at our photon, nobody in the universe knew the polarization of the other one, including the photon itself. We say that these two particles are entangled, and the process of our crystal making one photon into two entangled photons is called spontaneous parametric downconversion. And, according to Wikipedia, it also takes place in olive oil. If this is remotely true, then we can use a household kitchen supply to bypass $1,000 optical components and create entangled pairs of qubits, which is one of the difficult tasks of building a quantum computer. Now, I'm not going to use this against you to trick you into watching the whole video. I'll tell you right now that the answer to the title of this video is no, you cannot make a quantum computer out of olive oil. And maybe that's a lesson in why Wikipedia isn't always a reliable source. However, olive oil does have some interesting properties that do come from the effects of quantum mechanics. Not only that, but there are other chemicals found in plants and animals that you might be familiar with that can create quantum entangled particles. This video is going to start with a lightning fast introduction to quantum mechanics, so don't worry if you haven't understood everything I said up until now. We're going to use that to figure out what happens inside of olive oil, and we're going to see how scientists have used this protein found in jellyfish to create pairs of entangled qubits. The main idea of quantum mechanics is that things are everywhere, in every state, until you look at them, and then they decide where they'll be. And that sounds pretty stupid. My table is inside my room. If I leave my room and walk back in, it won't be on the other side of the wall. But we have that intuition because a table is made out of octillions of atoms that are all constantly being seen in some way or another. So they average out, and the table is always a table in the same spot. We usually only see the counterintuitive effects of quantum mechanics on very small scales, like a single electron or a single photon. For these kinds of objects, there are a number of physical quantities we can measure, things like position, or momentum, or energy, or angular momentum we call observables. In classical physics, observables are just a number, and we can predict them if we know other quantities. But in quantum physics, the state of a system is given by a probability distribution called a wave function. This gives the possibilities of values that an observable could have once you measure them, but until you do, the system is in a superposition of all possible values. So think about an electron in a hydrogen atom. Until we measure where the electron is, the electron itself does not know where it is. All it knows is that it has a 3% probability of being here, and a 5% probability of being here, so the wave function might look something like this. These are the orbitals that you might have learned about in chemistry class. Another example is polarization in light. If light is elliptically polarized, then it's in a superposition of horizontally and vertically polarized, so measuring it would mean looking at it through a polarizer. Once we look at it, each photon decides whether it'll be horizontal and go through, or vertical and get blocked. So the wave function might look like this. The key thing is, until the photon reaches your eye, it doesn't know whether it went through your sunglasses or not, because it did both at the same time. There are some other weird results of quantum mechanics, too. For example, because unmeasured particles don't have a definite position, they can sometimes appear on the opposite side of a barrier that seems impossible to pass. This is called tunneling. Also, because of the way that potential energy can affect a system's wave function, particles are often restricted to certain energy levels instead of being able to have any energy they want. This is why electrons in an atom occupy an energy orbital, and why an LED made of one material can only produce light at a certain wavelength. It's also where the name quantum comes from. The energy is quantized. 
The phenomenon of entanglement that I told you about earlier is also a direct result of superposition. If a particle somehow gets split in two, then by conservation of momentum, the angular momentum, or spin, of the two new particles has to add up to the original. But remember, they could be in a superposition of both of the allowed spins, spin up and spin down. So once we measure one of them and collapse the wave function, we now know what the other particle's spin is. That doesn't sound very weird at all until you remember that the particle itself did not know what its own spin was until you measured it. But it had to decide at the exact moment that you measured its entangled partner. So quantum mechanics requires some sort of mysterious influence to reach entangled particles instantly, no matter how far away they are. Of course, relativity doesn't allow that. That would mean that this information travels faster than the speed of light. But is it really information? If each scientist takes one of the two particles, they have no way of knowing whether the other scientist has already measured it or not. Whenever they measure the spin, they'll just think that they were the one to collapse the wave function. So, as odd as it is philosophically, we just kind of deal with it. Our discussion of entanglement takes us to this Wikipedia page, Spontaneous Parametric Down Conversion. Again, this is when one photon is split into two photons, each with a higher wavelength. According to the article, by shining a common green laser pointer through the olive oil, it will scatter red photons showing its path through the olive oil. It does not work with other classic household salad oils. Well, let's see if that's true. Hey, it is. Looks pretty cool. But is it really spontaneous parametric down conversion? There's already a couple of red flags that make me skeptical. For starters, green light is around 550 nanometers and red light is like 700 nanometers, so it's not anywhere near close to dividing the energy by two. Maybe one emitted photon is 700 nanometers and the other is 1750 nanometers, which would be infrared, but they definitely can't both be the same frequency. I think the bigger problem is, though, that we can see it. Let me explain. A BBO can cost upwards of $1,000. It's the highest entanglement efficiency that science can buy. Yet still, when you pump it with light from, say, a 120 milliwatt laser, the amount of entangled photons that you get is in the realm of 100 per second. 100 photons is tiny. That means that only 0.1% of all photons end up getting entangled, and the rest leave the crystal unchanged. Yet, when we shine a $10 laser from Amazon through a glass of Costco olive oil, it shines bright red. If this is SPDC, then why aren't scientists using olive oil? The chemical that gives us this interesting color change is chlorophyll, the green pigment in plants. I went to my local overpriced organic grocery store to buy chlorophyll, which is apparently sold as a health supplement. Unless you're some kind of plant vampire that needs chlorophyll instead of blood, I cannot explain why any human would consume this. I found this chlorophyll water for $5 for single bottle, but I didn't think it would be concentrated enough, so instead I got this stuff. When I got home and tried the green laser on it though, nothing happened. The laser was still green. And this is weird, because it's well documented that chlorophyll is the substance in olive oil that gives it the red color. We'll get back to why this is later. So what's going on? Why does pure green light become red? Remember that one of the results of quantum mechanics is quantization. Just like a hydrogen atom or a piece of silicon, chlorophyll has specific energy levels that electrons are allowed to be in. The lowest level is called the ground state. But a molecule can also have energy by vibrating in various ways, so that creates more possible energy bands near the big ones. Green light with a wavelength of 532 nanometers has just enough energy to push an electron from the ground state into the first excited state, plus a couple of vibrational bands. The electron can then move down these small bands, and each time, the energy is turned into vibration, which we call heat. After the electron loses some of its energy to heat, the only way it can relax back to the ground state is by emitting a photon with this much energy, and that is 620 nanometers, or red light. This is called fluorescence, the same fluorescence that makes neon clothes and certain rocks glow under a black light. That sounds like a good explanation, but why doesn't it work on pure chlorophyll? Well, the health supplement I bought is actually sodium copper chlorophyllins. 
This is almost chlorophyll, but the center magnesium ion has been replaced with copper. This changes the allowed energy bands, which means the fluorescence happens at different wavelengths. Now, fluorescence is neat and all, but it doesn't create pairs of entangled photons. Or does it? Allow me to introduce green fluorescent protein. This substance glows green under UV or blue light, and it was first extracted from a type of bioluminescent jellyfish. Although, if you live in the US, you might be familiar with it through glowfish, the genetically modified pets that express this protein. Whether it's for pets, art pieces, or medical research, we've also used GFP to engineer glow-in-the-dark mice, rabbits, pigs, cats, and dogs. Just like chlorophyll, GFP fluoresces when it absorbs a high-energy photon, which could be ultraviolet or blue, then it loses some of its energy to heat and emits a lower energy photon as it returns to the ground state. But if two photons excite the protein at the same time, it's possible for GFP to emit two photons of different frequencies that add up to twice the original frequency. This is called spontaneous four-wave mixing, and when it happens, the polarizations of the resulting photons are entangled. A common problem with experiments involving quantum states is that as soon as you make a measurement, the wave function collapses. But a measurement doesn't have to be a scientist writing down a number. Any time a quantum system interacts with its environment, with the macroscopic world, it's at risk of collapsing. In superconducting quantum circuits, this means that the components have to be cooled to tens of millikelvin, hundreds of times colder than outer space. But the structure of green fluorescent protein partly solves this problem. The protein's outside portion is called the beta barrel, and inside of it is the fluorophore, the part that actually glows. Because the fluorophore is inside this structure, it's protected from the environment, other molecules, water, so the system stays quantum, it stays coherent. Scientists have been able to take advantage of these neat properties that GFP has to create entangled photons. Although it's not necessarily the easiest or best way of entangling particles, it has the interesting advantage of being able to modify with biology. Green fluorescent protein can be produced and harvested by genetically modified bacteria, like E. coli. By swapping out different amino acids, we can engineer bacteria to make fluorescent proteins with different parameters. And we don't even need to be the ones making the modifications. If we incentivize bacteria correctly, then we can watch them evolve to create optimal quantum materials. Tomorrow's quantum computers, breaking RSA encryption and simulating chemistry and whatever else they're theorized to do, probably won't be made out of olive oil. Well, they definitely won't be made out of olive oil. That Wikipedia article wasn't even right in the first place, and it's been corrected since then. But who knows? Maybe they will be made by genetically modified bacteria. If this video got you interested in quantum mechanics, optics, or any of the math behind it, the best place to learn more and get real practice is from this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform that has thousands of lessons from beginner to university level in math science and computer science, and every month they're adding more. The lessons are focused on hands-on activities so you can build your own intuition on hard topics. From a teaching point of view, I absolutely love the course on scientific thinking because you try what you're learning yourself. For example, in the quantum light lesson, you get to experiment with polarizers to see how they affect the state of light, just like we learned about in this video. To try Brilliant free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash physicsforthebirds, or visit the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you to Brilliant for supporting this video, and thank you for supporting me.